Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at the Roaring Twenties from 1920 to 1932. Uh, this period of time immediately following World War I is one of great change and uh, uh, diversity in terms of thought process, ranging from very, very conservative to very, very liberal uh, and everything obviously in between. So to start with, when we think of the Roaring Twenties, the first thing we have to acknowledge is the growth of consumerism. Um, this is a boom time for people buying stuff. There's a lot of money to invest in new factories to be produced. There's new business techniques uh, that are being employed in growing their businesses. And two, there's a lot of new innovation going on when it comes to new consumer goods being created. And so as a result, people are going to start buying, 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 buying everything they can get their hands on uh, during the 1920s. Um, for example, things like the car or the radio, uh, people are going to um, not necessarily be able to afford it, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but really, it's that growth of advertising that is prompting them to buy this stuff. It's not that people... Um, have more money in their pockets, but advertising, which springs up everywhere, whether it's commercials on the radio that they're listening to or billboards on the side of the road that they see um, or in the magazines or the newspapers, is really prompting them to buy all of this stuff, whether it be a car or a radio or a vacuum cleaner or a washing machine or whatever these new consumer products are during the 1920s. Um, and since people are only making slightly more money than they had in previous generations, people are really buying this stuff on credit. These are not credit cards. People are using what's called installment buying to buy stuff. So you'd go to the store and say, I want to buy a radio. Um, here is a small down payment and every month you would make um, a monthly payment on that product. And so really when we think of the 1920s, once again, from the outside, it seems like we're doing really, really, really well, but it's all being built on a very, very shaky, crumbling foundation. You know, the fact that people can't actually afford the products that they're buying is going to lead to major problems later on, aka the Great Depression is on the horizon. So one of the biggest changes when it comes to consumerism is the automobile. Now, automobiles have been around for a while, but really it was the product uh, that only rich people could afford, right? You know, most regular middle class people couldn't afford a car. That is until Henry Ford comes along and tweaks mass production just a little bit more. Now, if we've talked, if we remember before, when it comes to mass production, we're talking about unskilled workers, we're talking about interchangeable parts, but Henry Ford tweaks it even more using those same strategies before, but now he's going to include the assembly line. So whereas before, you know, the chassis of the car would sit on the ground and the workers would move around the car, putting on the wheels and the windshield and, you know, the engine and all the things that you need to build a car. Now they would raise it up. They'd put it on a conveyor belt and the humans wouldn't move, but the car would move. And the person, uh, the people along the assembly line do the same job over and over and over again. If my job is to put the wheel on the car, that is the only thing I do. And then that car moves down the line to the next person who bolts that wheel on. Um, and this slight little change um, allows for the mass production of the automobile um, to increase exponentially, meaning Henry Ford can cut the cost. Also meaning the average person can now uh, uh, afford, quote unquote, an automobile. So whereas in 1910, we only saw about 181,000 cars on the road in the United States, by 1929, that's up to 26 million Fords. Many of them are the Model T, which is the most popular uh, car for Henry Ford for that common man. It is a bare bones, no frills type automobile. Um, but this really is going to change everything about American life um, because not only does that increase the cars on the road, but now that's going to increase 
you know, rubber production and glass production and uh, uh, converting the old petroleum products of kerosene now to gasoline uh, to make it uh, for this new lifestyle. We need to build a highway system. And in the 1920s, we see the creation of what were the white shield highways. Think Route 66 is a prime example of the white shield highways because Americans now are in cars. They want the freedom to be able to move anywhere they want to in the country, whether that's across the country or whether it is commuting from the suburbs to the city and back again, instead of it being in you know the rail cars before or the cable cars or the subways, now it's in their own automobile, their own Model T Ford. Um, additionally, we see people like Frederick W. Taylor utilizing that scientific method uh, uh, and research to try to apply that then to business techniques. This is called Taylorism. So using that scientific method, scientific research to really tweak innovation and tweak um, efficiency when it comes to the mass production of not just cars, but literally everything. Everything now is going to change as a result of uh, the assembly line. We make everything this way now. Um, and it is also going to raise the standard of living slightly. This is going to create jobs in not just the automobile industry, but in all other industries related to it as well. I hear you see an ad for a new Ford, which would obviously lure you in because you don't want to be the only person without a car. Here you see not just an automobile on the highway, one of those new highways built in the 1920s, but advertisements in the form of billboards on the side of the road to get you to buy other products. Gas stations obviously have to start springing up in order to fuel these new automobiles. And uh, top left corner, we see uh, that assembly line. As the car moves down the assembly line, the men stay uh, stationary. And then uh, the cost of the Model T uh, based on the um, average worker and how long it takes them. So that drastically, drastically drops how much it costs to buy a new car. Um, this image shows the new highway system, the White Shield Highway. These are not the freeways that we think of today, those are coming in the 1950s. These are those white shield highways, like Route 66 is probably the most famous. Okay, other changes in the 1920s. Uh, aside from the car, the radio is actually the number one bought consumer product of the 1920s. Now, first invented by Marconi back in the 1890s. Originally, it was used for war effort, World War I, etc. But like everything else, it's going to jump into the consumer market. Um, the first broadcast radio program going out in November of 1920, you could literally hear the results of the national elections coming in as they happen. You don't have to wait for uh, the newspaper the next day. You can literally hear the politicians speaking to you directly on the radio. Um, it's going to make politics much more personal to the American people. Additionally, aside from it changing politics, which that's going to continue on for the next several decades, uh, the advent of the radio as a consumer product also becomes uh, a, a way to enjoy yourself, right? The family would gather around the radio in the night, uh, listening to the national radio shows, like think Little Orphan Annie is probably the most famous that we would think of today. Um, and obviously, once again, just like television today, commercials make their way onto these radio broadcasts, prompting you to buy, 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 keep buying more stuff in order to spur this supposed economic growth of the 1920s. But once again, people are buying these products on credit. Uh, here you see an ad for a radio in the left corner. Uh, and then on the right side, you see a family gathered around the radio listening to a radio broadcast at night. Okay, when we think of the 1920s, we also think of serious social changes. So I said at the beginning that this is a very conflicting era, a very dichotomous era. On the one side, we see massive social changes happening. But we also see a return to conservatism um, when it comes to politics and other social pro pro uh, projects as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But 
on the one side, you know, the women's rights movement has come to um, a somewhat close with women getting that right to vote in 19, uh, 1920 with the 19th Amendment. But now those women's groups are going to find other areas to focus on to help women achieve more equality. For example, Margaret Sanger created the American Birth Control League. Today, we call this Planned Parenthood. And the focus here is on obviously giving women more control over how many babies they have during their life. Um, This is not the pill that doesn't come till the 1960s, but other birth control methods to help women um, make these choices all of which are pretty much illegal at this time. But what are you going to do about that? Um, Margaret Sanger was also a proponent for eugenics, which is uh, a pretty gross way of saying genetically engineering society. The the Nazis are really going to take this and run later on. But it was actually a very popular idea back in the 1920s. Now, that National Woman's Party, remember Alice Paul, She had been a huge advocate for the 19th Amendment. But now that that's been achieved, she doesn't just go home and take a nap. No, now the National Women's Party is going to focus on getting an equal rights amendment ratified to the U.S. Constitution. You can always abbreviate this, the ERA. Um, The focus of this would have been similar to the 14th Amendment. But instead of denying equal citizenship rights based on race, They want this ERA added to say equal citizenship rights can't be denied on the basis of sex. Um, This is going to be a long lasting fight. We'll talk about it again in the 1970s, but the ERA was never ratified to the U.S. Constitution. But we'll talk about that later on in the 1970s and 80s. Um, We also see uh, a sexual revolution springing up in the 1920s. Now, in part, we see Margaret Sanger and that American Birth Control League at play here. We see the work of psychologist, um, I'm sorry, psychiatrist Sigmund Freud and his very out there ideas on sex. And also advertising is very much focused on uh, the beauty of the human body. And, you know, like we think of today, sex sells obviously the 1920s version, but still there is this awakening in um, sexuality in the 1920s with very suggestive words and images um, in advertising. As a prime example of this are a group of women known as flappers. This is kind of like the quote, new woman of the 1920s, a very new style, a new openness for women in the 1920s. Um, A flapper, she... Uh, is very sexually open. She has short bobbed hair. Maybe she wears dresses above her knees, scandalous, I know. Um, She wears makeup. She goes dancing. She smokes. She drinks. She is this new sexually open woman. But obviously, there is going to be um, a conflict with that, you know, almost a reaction against women such as this, as always is the case with changes in society. And finally, massive social changes when it comes to um, uh, African Americans in society. Now, remember that great migration, that mass migration of African Americans moving to northern cities during and after World War I. They'd come looking for jobs in the northern factories, they'd come to escape Jim Crow laws and uh, poverty wages in sharecropping. And not only were they coming to the northern cities, but they were bringing their music, their culture with them from all throughout the South and also a mass migration of Caribbean uh, uh, Blacks coming into the United States as well. They're settling in northern cities. And we see the birth of what is known as the Harlem Renaissance. Now, a renaissance is literally a rebirth, a cultural reawakening. And for the Harlem Renaissance, this is a reawakening for African Americans centered around the black neighborhood of Harlem, New York, right? Now, obviously, this is all throughout the northern cities, but Harlem really is the epicenter for this reawakening for African Americans. Um, If 
the 1920s had a soundtrack, it would be jazz, a distinctly African-American style of music that originated out of the Southern um, states and the Caribbean, but now it's transplanted to the Northern cities, right? So if you were to go to a club or listen to the radio or possibly um, a record coming soon, you could listen to jazz. It becomes part of what's called mass culture. We're all listening to the same things. Um, we're all watching the same movies. We're all reading the same things. That's mass culture. And jazz, as a distinctly st distinct style of African-American music, is part of that mass culture. Now, aside from a musical reawakening, we also see literature uh, reawakening. You know, uh, authors like um, Langston Hughes, the most famous poet from the um, Harlem Renaissance, is really writing about the Black experience in the 1920s. Um, we see a political reawakening with men like Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was actually a Caribbean immigrant to the United States, but very, very, very radical. He founded the United Negro Improvement Association, also known as the UNIA. And he is looking at this from a global Black person's perspective, because like I said, he's from Jamaica originally. Um, and he wants African Americans to only buy from other Black businesses, right? To keep their money within their community, to promote economic power. He wants a quote unquote back to Africa movement to take Africa back from the European colonists that have colonized all of Africa pretty much at this time. Very radical ideas. Um, and because he is seen as subversive by the U.S. government, um, the U.S. government is looking for a way to get rid of Marcus Garvey. And in fact, uh, they are able to deport him in the 1920s for mail fraud. Now, really, this is a trumped up charge to really just get this, you know, guy out of the United States. But these ideas that were brought about by Marcus Garvey and the UNIA will continue on. We'll see them later on in the Black Panther movement. We'll see them later on with men like Malcolm X. We'll see them later on with the Black Muslim movement. So these radical ideas don't disappear. They're just going to change and morph as we continue on through society and history. Uh, here on the left is Marcus Garvey. On the right is Margaret Sanger, and she is protesting uh, the um, illegalization of birth control for women by gagging herself as a form of protest. Uh, here we see examples of jazz clubs that you could go to in Harlem, whether it be the Apollo, you could go here, Duke Ellington play, or you could go to the Cotton Club and dance and hear the jazz and drink alcohol illegally, obviously, as the time goes on. Uh, here in the top left, you see some flappers, right? Very scandalously um, dressed, but dancing. In this case, they are doing the Charleston. And down in the right-hand corner, we see that evolution of jazz um, as a style of music uh, and how it has progressed into modern day as well. Uh, here are some more flappers. And as much as we see this new quote unquote morality springing up, we also see a reaction against that people that want to maintain the morality. So in this case, we see this man measuring these women's bathing suits on the beaches because if they're too short, they'll receive a fine and will be thrown off the beach. Very, very silly. Okay. So now we also see the 1920s as the beginning of the quote unquote first red scare. Now, remember, Russia has recently turned to communism. That's part of that Bolshevik revolution, right? We'd seen a communist revolution over in Russia, and now they are the Soviet Union or the USSR. There is massive, massive fear in the United States that that communist ideas, those very radical ideas might segue or might float into the United States. Remember, we've had a long history of labor unions with radical ideas. We've seen labor unions using strikes as a way to get uh, more power within the companies. And also remember, we see lots of immigrants 
pouring into the United States, many of whom are coming from Eastern Europe and Russia. So this quote unquote red scare, red is the color of communism, really, you know, grips Americans' hearts at this time. We also see, not without reason, that fear springing up because of a series of quote unquote bomb plots of 1919. In 1919, anarchist groups were mailing bombs in the mail to prominent people in the United States as a way to try to destabilize the U.S. economy, government, etc. This really also adds to the fear of these radical ideas and adds to the Red Scare. And so, under Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer and his protege, J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover will later go on to found the FBI, but under A. Mitchell Palmer and J. Edgar Hoover, they instituted the Palmer Raids. The Palmer Raids are using those espionage and sedition acts that we talked about in the last chapter uh, as a way to uh, send, quote unquote, radicals to prison. So now, even though World War I is over, we're still going to use those espionage and sedition acts to try to silence any of those radical ideas and send uh, radicals to prison. We're also going to see um, thousands of people, thousands of potential radical immigrants uh, deported from the United States as well. For example, the Buford, a.k.a. the Soviet Ark, this is one ship that had come out of Russia for the United States, was turned back and sent back to the Soviet Union. The message is clear. We're closed to your radical ideas. Uh, here is an image of that fear, that European anarchist in the background with the bomb in one hand and a dagger in the other is going to stab us in the back or throw a bomb at us. Okay, so across the United States, we see anti-syndicalism laws passed. These are state laws passed between 1919 and 1920 that make it illegal to advocate for the overthrow of capitalism in the United States. Throwing out freedom of speech, that fear of communism is too widespread. And really, we're going to see this also play a, play a role in trying to break apart unions during the 1920s. Um, we also see this play out with the trial of two um, Italian anarchists named Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomo Vanzetti, the, the uh, trial of Sacco and Vanzetti. In 1921, they were charged with killing a payroll master um, and were put on trial for murder. Now, the problem was for the uh, prosecution, Sacco and Vanzetti could prove that they were elsewhere when this murder occurred but they have roots in Eastern Europe. They are, they are, you know, out there anarchists. And so that fear of these ideas, that xenophobia, that fear of foreigners, that anti-immigrant, anti-anarchist uh, mentality really takes hold during this um, trial. And at the trial, the judge addressing the jury says, this man, pointing at Vanzetti, Although he may not actually have committed the crime attributed to him, he is nevertheless capable, culpable because he is the enemy of our existing institutions. They were both found guilty and electrocuted in 1927 for this murder. Here they are at their trial. Okay, this backlash against changes in society also comes out with the creation of the second Ku Klux Klan. Now, we'd seen the first Ku Klux Klan originate uh, after the Civil War. Remember, we'd seen this from former Confederate soldiers as a way to keep African Americans, quote unquote, in their place, to terrorize uh, Black Southerners, to keep them from voting, et cetera, et cetera. But we see a renewal, a rebirth almost, of the second Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. The 1920s is really considered by most historians the nadir or the lowest point of race relations, right, across the United States. We've already talked about racial violence in northern cities during Red Summer and other times. Um, we've already talked about mass lynchings in the South. It is widespread. And so in uh, the 1920s, we see this rebirth almost uh, even bigger than before, of the Ku Klux Klan. But this new Klan is not just targeting African-Americans, although 
let's be real, they are targeting African Americans. But anyone who is not a quote unquote WASP, white, Anglo Saxon Protestant. So Catholics and immigrants and Jews and African Americans uh, are all being targeted by this second clan. It is a nativist group, um, as uh, anti communist, anti black, anti immigrant, etc. Um, and we see the the growth of it, especially in the Midwest and in the Deep South. So think obviously the Deep South, but also think like Indiana as a prime place for this second Ku Klux Klan. We also see it rising because the creation of a movie, The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation, which is a motion picture that's shown across the United States, uh, really romanticized that first clan, almost presented them as the saviors for white society, almost nightlike um, at the time. And so millions of people are joining the Klan. And it was seen, as crazy as this sounds, as um, a civic organization, you know, that people would join. Um, uh, and as quickly as it rises, we also see it fall. The leaders of this second clan um, were discovered to have been embezzling money from the group. Um, one was actually charged with rape. Uh, and so the second clan uh, starts to decline by the end of the 1920s. Today, we see the growth of almost a third wave of the Ku Klux Klan, um, especially online. Here we see some images. The top is one of the intro scenes from The Birth of a Nation, and it is a quote from Woodrow Wilson. The white men were roused by mere instinct of self-preservation until at last had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South, to protect the white country. On the right, we see an ad for the Klan. And down below, we see Uncle Sam being de depicted as a loyal Klansman. Here we see thousands of Klan's women marching through DC in a parade. Okay, so also part of this reaction to change is going to be a reaction against immigrants. After World War I, which now people are starting to believe was a complete and total mistake, America turns to isolationism. We're gonna start to shut ourselves off from the outside world. That xenophobia, that fear of foreigners, really starts to grip Americans as hordes of uh, immigrants pour in from Europe, especially from Eastern and Southern Europe, places like Italy and Russia and Greece and Poland and Slovenia and all those types of countries. And so, as a way to stop these people from pouring in, Congress passes immigration laws to restrict it. First, with the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, to restrict immigration from any country to just 3% per year based on the 1910 census. So you look at the 1910 census, you see how many people were coming in from Italy that year. Now only 3% can come in from Italy. But that still allows way too many people, especially the undesirables from Southern and Eastern Europe to come in. And so three years later, Congress changes it to the Immigration Act of 1924. Sometimes it's called the National Origins Act or the Asian Exclusion Act. Now, instead of 3%, it's down to 2%. And based on the 1890 census, aka when Southern and, <clears throat> excuse me, when Southern and Eastern Europeans weren't coming into the United States. Uh, so for the first time in American history, more people are actually emigrating out of the United States or leaving the United States than are coming in. This law also drastically restricted all Asian immigrants pretty much until the 1940s. So the immigrants who are here gather in ethnic ghettos, Little Italy, Little uh, uh, Chinatown, Little Slovenia, Little Poland, uh, and are sticking to their own kind. I uh, hear you see Uncle Sam as the gatekeeper. And the changes over time of immigrants coming in, not just all immigrants, but especially targeting the quote unquote undesirables from Southern and Eastern Europe. They are poorer, they bring radical ideas with them. Okay. 
Finally, the last of the progressive amendments that we're talking about in these chapters is that 18th Amendment. We're going back in time again. That 18th Amendment finally comes to fruition to ban alcohol, the sale and production of alcohol. Um, it's enforced by the Volstead Act, right? But there is such a demand for alcohol that this is going to be one of those amendments that is extremely difficult to actually enforce. Northern cities have large immigrant populations that have a long tradition of drinking, uh, working class people drinking, men coming home from the war, the returning doughboys, as they were called, uh, uh, suffering from PTSD or what they called shell shock at the time, want to drink. And so alcohol pro prohibition is going to be very difficult to actually enforce. Uh, Volstead agents um, or prohees, as they were called, were easily bribed. And there's too much money to be made in alcohol. So people working as rum runners to run across the borders to get alcohol and bring it back or to produce bathtub gin, making alcohol at home to sell on the black market, right? Um, and this is obviously going to also mean the rise of organized crime. But there were some positives to prohibition. Um, savings went up at this time. Absenteeism at work went down because people weren't drop dead drunk all the time. Uh, here you see some prohibition agents pouring out illegal alcohol. But down in the right corner, we see people drinking illegally at what were called speakeasies. These are illegal bars during prohibition. Here we see some men uh, in front of a moonshine distillery or a still making illegal alcohol. And the impact of prohibition as breweries go down, wineries go down, um, the alcoholic beverages go down, but also keep in mind tax revenue drastically drops as a result of prohibition because the government can't tax it now. That's going to be a problem when the depression hits. Okay. And finally, for this section, we're looking at organized crime. Prohibition absolutely leads to organized crime. There is a demand. Somebody is going to supply it. If we can't do it legally, we're going to see gangs springing up to supply it illegally. Not just alcohol, but other illegal things like drugs and prostitution. Um, and gangs are going to engage in gang warfare to corner the market, to be the only gang to supply alcohol to their city. Um, and so it's estimated that about 12 to 18 billion dollars are being made every year um, in illegal alcohol at this time, none of which, as we know, is being taxed. The most famous of the organized crime uh, uh, gangsters is Al Capone, aka Scarface. He cornered the market in Chicago. Um, he was labeled public enemy number one by the U.S. government. Uh, he had mass murdered men from a rival gang, Bugs Moran's gang, during the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. But even though there's all this talk about Al Capone, they can't actually convict him for all the crimes that he was committing because nobody wants to um, testify in court against him because they also don't want to die. But he was finally brought down by several government agents, including Elliot Ness, a prohibition agent, and his group of untouchables. They were unwilling to take a bribe. And he was brought down for tax evasion and finally sent to prison. Here is Al Capone before going to prison, obviously. Okay. And we'll stop there for right now. See you guys in part two. Bye.